All right, so you have the same handout attached for this genetics part one note that we're going to take. And we're basically going to learn the notes through doing two labs. And this is the first of the two labs. Um, so again, you should have the exercise nine genetics one um, open. If you can print it, it's a lot easier to do. And uh, if you can't print it, at least you should be following along on a notebook with the lab open on the side. And the reason I want you to have it open or at least print it is because obviously the quality of this document camera isn't very good. So you can't exactly read what I'll be looking at and showing you on here. Um, my handwriting will be a lot clearer than the actual um, text printed on here. And I'll be verbally explaining that as well. But I want you to be able to read and follow along in case reading is your stronger trait rather than listening. So we're going to go ahead and get started. At the end, you will take a little bit of notes on your um, notebook that you'll also be turning in alongside of this. Um, so be prepared to do that as well. Um, so for this first section, we're just going to talk about the background of monohybrid crosses and human genetic traits. And then we'll get into the different kinds of crosses and different kinds of um, traits that humans have that are special cases. So in the introduction, it says genetics is the study of inheritance. A zygote contains genetic information from each of its parents, but becomes a unique individual. Um, you should probably write this down, at least at some point. All physical and behavioral traits that constitute or make up an individual are its phenotype. So phenotype is the physical characteristics right here. Physical phenotype, PH, PH, pretty easy to remember. So when you see the actual physical individual and you see that they have blue eyes or they have brown hair, that's a phenotype. Um, it says your hair color and your height are both phenotypic quality uh, traits, qualities that you can see. In contrast, a genotype refers to the gene or genes that influence a phenotypic trait. So when you look at somebody, you can't see their genotype because that's in their DNA. It's their genes. Um, you can predict them, but you won't necessarily be exactly right because there are things like dominance that um, kind of make it hard to tell exactly what the genotype is. But the genotype is the genes and the phenotype are the physical characteristics. The genotype of an organism is set at fertilization. Two gametes, a sperm and an egg, unite combining their DNA. The phenotype, however, is a product of the genotype as well as the environment in which the individual grows up. So the example would be, yes, you may be born with brown hair, but in your environment, you get the chance provided to you that your friends are dyeing their hair, so you also dye your hair. So now your hair has is brown, but it also has blonde streaks in it. And your genetics don't say, hey, this person also has blonde hair. Um, so that's an environmental change on the phenotype um, that your genotype isn't necessarily dictating for you. After studying meiosis and the production of haploid gametes, you know that a diploid cell has two sets of chromosomes, one from each parent. Although homologous chromosomes are composed of genes for the same traits in the same order, they may have different forms of the same genes. For instance, at the site of the gene that influences the presence of freckles, one chromosome may have a version of the gene that results in freckles, while its homologue may have a gene that results in no freckles. Different versions of the same genes are called alleles. So these highlighted sections are good sections for you to write down as notes to yourself. If you are homozygous, homo meaning the same, if you're homozygous for an allele, it means that you have two copies of that allele. Maybe you have two alleles for no freckles. On the other hand, maybe you have two alleles for freckles, right? You have two alleles that code for the same thing, which means homozygous. If you have two different alleles, one on each homologous chromosome for a single gene, maybe one for freckles and one for no freckles, then you are heterozygous because hetero means different. You're heterozygous for that gene. If a heterozygote or an individual that is heterozygous shows the phenotype of only one of its alleles, Remember, it only shows one, even though um, it has one of each. If it only shows one, that allele is considered the dominant allele, and the other allele is recessive. So the dominant allele always shows, even if there's only one copy of it. The recessive allele is hidden unless there's no dominant allele covering it. In the case of complete dominance, the dominant allele completely masks the expression or effect of the recessive allele. So basically on the note on the side here, a heterozygote looks exactly like a homozygote dominant. So that's why I said when you look at a phenotype, you can't exactly tell if they like what their genotype is, because when traits have um, when traits are dominant, that means that your heterozygous individuals 
have the same exact phenotype as the homozygous dominant individuals. So you can't actually tell if their genotype is capital capital or capital lowercase just looking at them. But you'll be able to tell a recessive homozygous individual because they will look different and they'll look like the recessive trait because they don't have a dominant to cover up the recessive. Um, so for the, in the example of freckles, if you have one allele for freckles and the other for no freckles, you will have freckles, which is your phenotype because the allele that has freckles is dominant. The allele that results in no freckles is, is recessive. You will have the phenotype of no freckles only if you are homozygous for no freckles. And that is basically saying that you have two copies of the no freckle allele. The lighting on this is kind of whack. So we're gonna look at this picture right here where F represents the dominant allele for freckles and lower, sorry, capital F represents the dominant allele for freckles and lowercase f represents the recessive allele for no freckles. So notice that the allele is always marked with the same letter, but the capital represents the dominant and the lowercase represents the um, recessive. So we notice here, if you can see on yours, it's a little clearer than on the screen, but the father's genotype is capital F, capital F, so he's homozygous dominant and therefore he has freckles. The mother is lowercase f, lowercase f, so she's homozygous recessive, which means that she has no freckles. So her egg can only carry one lowercase f, and his sperm can only carry one uppercase f, because obviously he can only give capital, and she can only give lowercase. And so the child will always get a capital lowercase, which is heterozygous for freckles, but because the capital F for freckles is dominant, then the child will also show the phenotype of having freckles. When Gregor Mendel began his experiments with pea plants in 1856, genes and chromosomes had not yet been discovered. However, he discovered the basic principles of genetics through his analysis of phenotypic ratios. He crossed pea plants of certain phenotypes and used the phenotypes of the resulting offspring to determine the genetic makeup of the parent and the process by which their characteristics were passed on. The simplest tests Mendel performed involved the inheritance of single traits that had only two forms. So those are the easiest ones to identify. We now know that he was examining traits controlled by single genes that only had two possible alleles. You will perform several crosses using colored pop beads to represent two different alleles of a gene. So these are the pop beads that we're gonna be talking about and using. Um, red will represent the dominant allele, represented capital R, and yellow, I say yellow, but we're actually gonna be using white, will be the recessive allele, which is lowercase r. We're not gonna work in pairs, I'll just be doing this as a demo. So one lab partner will be homozygous dominant, meaning that they will have capital R, capital R, which means that that individual is going to have two red pop beads to represent their um, alleles. And then the other is going to be recessive, homozygous recessive, which means they have two recessive, which is gonna be two white alleles. The two beads represent the alleles on homologous chromosomes. So they represent the same genes on different chromosomes. So one from the mom, one from the dad. When gametes are formed by meiosis, each gamete receives one chromosome of a homologous pair. So a single bead may represent a gamete and an allele on that chromosome. You and your partner, AKA my left hand and my right hand are going to be mating by exchanging gametes or exchanging one of the beads at a time by random chance. So we're gonna be doing mating using pop beads in section 9.1. This cross may be written as capital R, capital R, X, lowercase r, lowercase r, and the X is represented like multiplication or times. You and your partner are parental or P generation, P for parental, and your progeny or your offspring will be the first filial or F1 generation. So the F1 is the first filial or first child generation. So we're gonna take the two gametes and we're gonna shake them and choose one without looking. The partner should do the same. So my right hand and my left hand are gonna be doing this. Um, keep in mind that one of them is homozygous dominant and one is going to be homozygous recessive. And I'm gonna be randomly dropping one from each hand and then we're gonna do that cross three times total and mark it down in the table right here. And then uh, um, we're gonna be marking the letters so we're not gonna be marking the colors. And notice that at the cross of the table, they actually already wrote the cross for us. And you're always gonna write the cross near the table or near the um, Punnett score that we're gonna be doing. So here we have capital R, capital R, which is these two, the dominant, dominant, homozygous, dominant. And then we have lowercase, lowercase R, which is the homozygous recessive, which is represented by white and white. So if I just by random chance drop one from here and drop one from here, then I'm going to be having a capital R and a lowercase R. 
And our first F1 genotype is going to be capital R, lowercase r written there. And we're going to return them back to their original hand that they were from, and we're going to randomly drop another one from each side. And obviously, because they can only give such things, you're going to be giving a capital R and a lowercase r. So we're going to write a capital R and a lowercase r again for the second offspring. We'll return them back, and then by random chance, we'll do one last one where we're shaking, and... Here we have a capital R and a lowercase r. So as you can see, you should be able to answer these questions now, explaining number four. What are the possible genotypes produced by this cross? Are there any other ones possible or is it just capital R, lowercase r? You tell me. Number five, one parent exhibited the dominant phenotype, which was the capital R, capital R right here. And the other exhibited the recessive phenotype, which is the lowercase r, lowercase r. What phenotypes are exhibited by the F1 generation right here? Are they going to be the dominant phenotype or the recessive phenotype? Number six, is it possible to produce offspring when the recessive phenotype, uh, with the recessive phenotype from this cross? So is it possible that any of the offspring will have lowercase r, lowercase r? Is it possible that they would show the phenotype for lowercase r, lowercase r? You tell me for number six. Okay, members of the F2 generation are the progeny. Oh, also when you get to these questions, you can always pause my video and then continue working on your own until you're ready to move on to the next section where I'm doing demos again. Members of the F2 generation are the progeny from crosses between the progeny of the F1 generation, AKA you're taking the babies from the F1, wait till they grow up and you're going to mate them to each other. This is um, kind of weird if you think about it in respect to uh, people or animals, but it happens a lot in plants because plants and inbreeding aren't, they don't have as many detrimental effects as uh, it happens in animals. So you can predict the genotypes that will occur in the F2 generation by making a Punnett square. This is the setup of a Punnett square. And usually we put the mom on the top and we put the dad on the side. Okay. To fill in the square, write the possible gametes from one parent, female, along the top of the square, and the possible gametes on the other parent, the male, along the left side of the square. Into the squares, you're going to write out the genotypes produced by each combination of gametes and fill this Punnett square for the F1 mating, capital R, lowercase r, times capital R, R, lowercase r. And this is coming from the F1 generation that we produced here, right? Because we're now going to do a cross with the F1 generation to produce the possibilities in the F2 generation. So when you have capital R, lowercase r, um, times capital R, lowercase r, you're first of all going to write it down near the Punnett square. And then you're going to be taking the mom right here and putting her gametes on two separate boxes now. She can give a capital R and she can also give a lowercase r. The dad is over here and as you can see, he's similar. He can give a capital R and he can also give a lowercase r. Okay. So now we're going to put them together in each box and we'll see what the possibilities are percentage wise of uh, each offspring in the F2 generation being any kind of um, gen uh, genetic makeup. So here, if you move the big R down and you move this big R over, you're going to get a possible genotype of capital R, capital R. If you move the big R over and the small R down, you're gonna get a possible genotype of big R, little r. If you move the big R down and the little r over, you're gonna get a possible genotype of big R, little r. And you notice that we always write the little r second, no matter which side we're looking from first, because we that's just how you write them. For genotypes, you always write the dominant, you know, uh, the dominant gene or allele first, no matter which order or if they came from the top or the side. And then lastly, we're going to bring the little r down and the little r over, and we're going to have one possible phenotype, or sorry, one possible genotype of little r, little r. Okay, and we know that when you have things divided by four, you're going to be working in percents of 25, right? So looking at the result of your uh, Punnett square, you should predict that the offspring will occur with a genotypic ratio of one to two to one. That is one homozygous dominant right here. That is two heterozygous, which is right here and here, and one homozygous recessive, which is right here. Okay, so that technically means that right here we're going to have um, one homozygous dominant, which is 25%. 
two heterozygous, which is 50%, and one homozygous recessive, which is 25%. And these should all totally add up to be 100% when you add them all up. Okay. We're going to change beads so that the partners have F1 genotype each, which means that each individual now is going to have one red and one white representing one capital R and one lowercase r. And so both hands have the same thing, one capital R, one lowercase r, and we're going to be random mating, random by chance and dropping random gametes 10 times and writing it down in the table right here, which shows our F1 cross to produce the F2 generation or F2 genotype, which is capital R lowercase r times capital R lowercase r. And so by random chance, our first F2 genotype that is produced is capital R, lowercase r. And so we're going to return them back and make sure that you always have capital R, lowercase r in each hand. And we're going to buy random chance drop. And we got capital R, lowercase r for our second one. And random dropping. We got capital R, lowercase r. And here we got capital R, capital R. For the fifth one, We got capital R, lowercase r. For the sixth one, we have capital R, lowercase r. For the seventh one, we have Lowercase r, lowercase r. For the eighth one, we're going to have capital R, capital R. For the ninth one, we're going to have lowercase r, lowercase r. And for the 10th one, we're going to have capital R, lowercase r. So now you're going to answer these questions. Looking at the data from the whole class, is the genotypic ratio 1 to 2 to 1 as predicted? You tell me, how many did we see that were capital R, capital R? How many did we see that were capital R, lowercase r? And how many did we see that were lowercase r, lowercase r? You tell me the numbers. In ratio to in ratio to each other and simplify it if you can. Um, number four, why is it better to use the combined data from this whole class instead of the individual results from one group? So in uh, if we were in class, I would have each partner pair at each table do the exact same thing we just did, and then we'll combine the numbers from everybody to do the ratio. And I want you to kind of maybe reason why it would be better to use so many more data points than just to use 10. Number five, tell me, what is the phenotypic ratio? Keep in mind, the phenotypic ratio is only going to have two things. It's going to have um, dominant to recessive. So when you have the dominant to the recessive, you're actually going to just be comparing two, even though we had three genotypes. And the reason is because the heterozygous um, individuals, aka the capital R, lowercase r, they have the same kind of phenotype as the dominant um, homozygous, which is the capital R, capital R. Okay. So you'd be adding those together and then comparing them to the recessive phenotype. Um, and then number six is what happened to the recessive phenotype? You want to tell me, is it going to be higher or lower in comparison to the dominant phenotype? And you can compare it to the genotype as well. So what we just did in the Punnett square was an example of a monohybrid cross. 
So monohybrid cross is when only one trait is being considered in a mating. That cross is called a monohybrid cross. So when you have a two by two Punnett square, it's always going to be a monohybrid cross. Let's look at some practice monohybrid cross problems and you'll need to draw Punnett square for each problem. I think they're provided for you in this lab though. But when you actually do um, the practice problem set that we're gonna do later on, you'll have to draw them yourself like this. So the practice problem is a widow's peak. And when you look at the picture, in humans, a widow's peak, capital H, is dominant over a straight hairline, which is lowercase h. Um, if one parent is homozygous dominant for a widow's peak while the other has a straight hairline, can they produce any children with a straight hairline? That is the question, okay? So if one parent is homozygous dominant for a widow's peak, that means that we already know, for example, that parent has a capital H, capital H, because they're dominant and they are both homozygous, which means they have two of the same kind of dominant. The other one has a straight hairline, which means that they are homozygous recessive automatically, because if they were heterozygous, then they would still show the dominant phenotype. Okay, so we notice that they have a straight hairline, which means that they have to be homozygous recessive, which is lowercase h, lowercase h. So we're going to find out what the possible phenotypes of the children are now, because we're going to put the mother in her cross against um, the father. And right here, we're going to write it out. Female gametes are going to be capital H and capital H from the mom. And the male gametes are going to be lowercase h, lowercase h. To be honest, it didn't matter if you wrote the father as capital H dominant or mother as capital H dominant, just because, right, it doesn't matter which um, parent it came from when it's these. If we're going to do sex-linked ones, we'll do later, then it does matter because the X and the Y chromosomes matter where you put them. Okay, so if we complete, complete this, we're going to have the capital H from here and the lowercase h from here. We'll have the capital H from here and the lowercase h from here. We'll have the capital H from here and lowercase h from here. And we have the capital H from here and the lowercase h from here. And if you look, all of the offspring have the same kind of genotypic ratio or the same kind of genotype presenting. So the possible phenotypes for the children are also all the same. Is this genotype going to be widow's peak or is this genotype going to be straight hairline? You tell me. Okay. The next practice problem is on albinism. So worldwide, about one out of every 17,000 people are affected by albinism. In these individuals, a defective enzyme results in the lack of production of a pigment protein called melanin, which is a determinant for skin color or hair color, skin color, and eye color. So an albino man marries an a normally pigmented woman who had an albino mother. Fill in the Punnett square below to indicate the genotypes of the children that this couple may have and the proportions of each. Albinism is recessive and normal pigmentation is dominant. So the man is albino, which means that he has lowercase a and lowercase a. We already know that because it says albinism is recessive. So he needs lowercase a, lowercase a in order to even be albino. Now, we know that the mother is normally pigmented. However, we also know that she had an albino mother, which means that one of her alleles is lowercase a. So since she looks normal, she has to have a capital A. But then since she has an albino mother, she has to also have a lowercase a. Okay, so we're going to put the cross over here. And we're going to write out the gametes. And so the mother has capital A, lowercase a and the father has lowercase a and lowercase a. And so let's see. So now you're gonna think about the genotypes, the ratio, and you also wanna think about their phenotype ratios. Which one, uh, what is the percent chance of a child having normal pigmentation? And what is the percent chance of a child having albinism? Okay, so after you thought about through that, you should be able to answer number two, which is what is the probability of this couple having a child with albinism, right? Is it 25? Is it 50? Is it 75? Is it 100? You tell me based on the Punnett square we just made. Another practice problem is tongue rolling. So the ability to curl your tongue up on the sides, capital T tongue rolling, is dominant to not being able to roll your tongue, aka lowercase t. A woman who can roll her tongue marries a man who cannot. Their first child has his father's phenotype. Fill in the Punnett square and answer the following questions. So a woman who can roll her tongue, remember curling her tongue is dominant. Okay. That means the mom has at least one capital D, but we don't necessarily know the other one yet. 
okay? The man cannot, which means that he is homozygous recessive, which would be lowercase t, lowercase t. Now, the child has his father's phenotype, which means that he has the he does not have the ability to roll his tongue. Not having the ability to roll his tongue means that he also has lowercase t, lowercase t, because remember, this is a recessive trait. So you have to be homozygous recessive in order to not be able to roll your tongue. Okay. This means that our cross means the mom has one capital T, but the child received two small t's. Obviously, one came from the father, but the second one automatically means that it came from the mother. Okay, that means the mom has to also have a lowercase t. Now, why does she have a lowercase t? Doesn't you, you'd be like, well, she can roll her tongue, so she has to be capital T. Well, also, you got to keep in mind that she can be heterozygous because she has the capital T, which enables her to roll her tongue because it's dominant. And the recessive little t is covered up. So overall, her phenotype is she's able to roll her tongue, but her genotype can be heterozygous. And let me prove it to you that she has this um, genotype. So if we do a test cross with this current setup, we're going to have capital T from the mom, lowercase d from the mom, lowercase d from the dad, lowercase d from the dad. So the mom is going to be producing capital T and lowercase t gametes, and the dad can only produce um, lowercase t gametes. So now we have this 50-50 ratio between can roll tongue and cannot roll tongue. Notice none of the kids are homozygous dominant because obviously the dad can only give a little t. Now, if you want to think about it and you want to say, hey, what if the mom had a capital T, capital T, and the dad still had the lowercase t, lowercase t, would this child have been possible? And in this case, you would go, well, if you look at all of the offspring produced by this cross of T, capital T, capital T, and lowercase t, lowercase t, then technically 100% of their children would be capital T, lowercase t, which would be tongue rolling, right? But we know that the kid has a father's phenotype, which is no tongue rolling, okay? So that's why this is not the correct answer, because we already know that the child has no tongue rolling. So based on this cross right here, you're going to answer the question, what is the probability that their second child will not be a tongue roller, right? You want to look at these percentages and tell me that.